and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest chit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the upcoming uh, upcoming zine-style RP adventure RPG known as Grok. I'm not sure I'm not sure quite how to say it with the exclamation point and the question mark, but I guess that's close enough. Don't call him Lavar, Mr. Lester Burton. How are you doing today, man? Doing well, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, I had, I had to get one Burton joke out of my system. Hey, that's all right. I've I've been called worse, so. And, well, that and I didn't feel like playing Tim Burton Bingo again. I do I do that enough as it is. That's that's a good call. Uh, so, I'd like to open up with the humble beginnings, as it were. Um, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Um. Okay. Yeah. My. Entry into the world of roleplay games was probably when I was about 10, 12 or so. My older brother played Dungeons and Dragons, and so I'd always get a hold of his books. And uh, I was never invited to to games early on, so I'd always just take his, you know, 3.0, 3.5 D and D books, mm -hmm. and just like read through it. And I was just enamored. Like I loved, I still love the art style in those books because mm -hmm. uh, it reminds me of like. Have you looked through like the three point three point five books? I still got them up. I still got them up on my shelf. And <laughs> same, yeah. It's just like the artwork, like the like the you know the races and classes. Like it looks like an old Da Vinci drawing, and I was just I loved it. And uh, the version that the three point version I had even came with the CD ROM, where you could uh, like do a character generator in there, mm -hmm. and it had like you know the defunct skills like uh, reading lips. And for some reason, every character I'd roll up. Always had, um, always had read lips for some reason. But yeah, that was my entry. Was just loving those books and rolling character after character, not knowing what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, my older brother invited me to a, a one shot game with all of his buddies, and he was maybe eighteen, nineteen at the time, and I was about twelve. And uh, so they did a one shot, and it was really just, you know, a social event for them because they've been playing for years. So they just took the opportunity to uh, get stoned to play Dungeons and Dragons. And I was just a 12 year old, just like mm -hmm. <laughs> enamored with be being someone else it was such a wild experience for me. Mm -hmm. So that, that was my start. And then I was um, back in that day, it was either you played, uh, you played Ultima online or you played EverQuest and I was in Ultima online. So I was in that for quite a while. And then it just, uh, Grew from there into you know systems. After systems, it began became a you know a collection of many books and systems and game types. Yeah, I um I remember skipping out on Ultima Online only because um in layman's terms I was an asshole. Okay. <laughs> well, I w um my preference for when it came to when it came to Ultima was the single player stuff. And yeah. yeah. At that at that time the at that time the idea of do, the idea of doing an online version of Ultima I end up thumbing my nose at. I can understand. I can understand that. If that sounds if that sounds a bit elitist and dickish, I was I was young and dumb, as we all were. No, I mean I I get it, and I mean I still I actually just tried playing a uh, port of Ultima Underworld a few weeks ago unsuccessfully. But yeah, I mean those games. Just, Ultima Online was a completely different experience, but I totally understand where you're coming from there. Yeah. It's funny you mention Ultima Underworld because um, I was recently made aware of a Edge magazine review of Doom, where they tried to argue that it that because of the fact that it didn't have the um, ability to look up and down like Ultima Underworld, Doom was an inferior game, <laughs> and that you should and that you should have had the ability to talk to monsters. Mm. Um, <laughs> which mm. I like to bring that kind of thing up just to just to illustrate that um, professional game professional game reviewers were idiots back then, just as much as they as they are now. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, now that's, that's an interesting take, though. Yeah, when 
Um, one thing that definitely stood out to me when it came to Grok is the visual style, and I know you, I know you des described just, I know you described on your profile as both a game designer and an artist and a musician. You know, just be, just being a triple threat guy. Um, do you, I'm assuming that the art is that the art is also done by you, and that being the case. Was Mobius one of your inspirations? Because that's the vibe that I g keep getting. It's it's very Mobius, but that so this art is actually done by uh, Medias Viral, who's an artist out of the UK, uh, and he goes by the handle Doodle Skelly on Instagram and uh, and Twitter. Mm -hmm. So check his so check his stuff out because it's all it's all in that style and it's phenomenal. Yeah. Actually, so all all the art on this project is from him, mm -hmm. uh, and. I discovered him through Reddit because I was playing No Man's Sky a while, and he's big into it. And so we frequented the same, you know, subreddits. And I came across his art, and I was like, "Wow, <laughs> this is awesome!" And I ended up getting a, a few pieces from him before before Grok was very long in development. And like those pieces were like were what kept me going mm -hmm. to get it to get it done and yep. to get the vision right. But yeah, I can't. His uh, his art style is awesome. Mm -hmm. Now I I know you I know you said that your that your introduction was three point five D and D, but I'm curious. I'm curious. I'm curious if you um if you dip if you dipped into some of the older stuff, given the um influences that you that you mentioned on the Kickstarter page. Yeah, so I've gotten. So it's only been the past few years that I've been getting into some of the old school, uh, old school games and the you know like the old school adjacent games, mm -hmm. um, and it's and it's part of I think I'm just blessed with a really awesome gaming group in that there's pretty much four core players between us in the group, and three of us rotate you know DMing uh, pretty much every other campaign so. Um, so we rotate through a bunch of different systems depending on what type of we're game going, and so that's given me the opportunity to try a bunch of different systems, including some of the some of the old school ones. Yeah. Um, but the ones that I gravitate to most, or at least most recently, have been the you know the very streamlined approach to to games and keeping you know the the rulings over rules approach. I think it's just it's so convenient from you know being able to run a game perspective. And from a player perspective, because you don't have to worry about what's on your sheet. You can just play the way you want to play mm -hmm. and and let it happen. You know. Yeah. Now, you ended up you ended up mentioning a handful of games in that in the paragraph talking about design. And I'm cur I'd be curious to go through those names to kind of to kind of pick at what parts of each you were inspired by. Yeah, that and sounds I, good. So. Going from the going from the top to the bottom, um, Cortex Prime. Yeah, so it's hard. So so this is going to be tricky without getting too much caught in the weeds, but I'm going to try. So Cortex Prime. Uh, it was funny when I when I did my first big build of what was Grok a few years ago. Mm -hmm. It was it was very heavily inspired by Cortex Prime, kind of, kind of by accident. Um, so Cortex Prime, you know, they, one of the main mechanics is you, you basically have, you know, aspects similar to, to fate where you can pretty much describe anything by tags or by aspects. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but they're, but those descriptions are weighted by a die value, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so you can say, I have a sharp dagger and if it's really sharp, then it would be a D8 sharp dagger. If it's a super sharp, then it'd be a D12, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so before I had started delving into Cortex, I had played some games of Fate, and uh, one of the parts that I didn't like about it is is that uh, there wasn't a lot of weight in there, it was pre and it was very abstract and not necessarily character immersive. It was more story, more story immersive, and Cortex, in my view, helps bridge that a little bit, um, and so. So the mechanics of Grok is that uh, the stats themselves have die values associated with them, right? So you have uh, so you have physical, mental, and uh, and social stats, 
and those have die values that tell you how confident you are at those type of actions. And that's very similar to how Cortex Prime does their stats, uh, which is also, which which is, which I'm very certain Cortex Primes and how they do their stats was very influenced on the uh, on World of Darkness stat array, the matrix, the three by three, um, but they just consolidated a bit. Yeah. So 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 that's probably the the primary influence on Grok is is how they attribute. Um, die values to attributes mm -hmm. um we just take it in a slightly different direction yeah um electric bastion land yeah it's such a beautiful game like the the layout and the ease of play and the simplicity of it like those i think i think that game personified personifies those elements very very well and so uh and and it's simple approach to attributes as well um so I think those are the characters I tried to emulate in Brock as far as keeping things simple and streamlined and, and intuitive. Mm -hmm. um, Fate Core. Yeah, so I teased a little bit about this. So Fate Core, I think Cortex Prime borrows a lot from Fate Core. Uh, and so um, not only attributes, but in Grok you have different uh traits that are pretty much aspects you know they just descriptors about who your character is mm -hmm. and um unlike cortex prime where you as ascribe a die value to that since the die values are built into the attributes in grok uh the traits are are just blanket blanket statements about your character that apply to anything you do mm -hmm. you know so if you're if you're a curmudgeon dwarf and that's relevant to whatever's going on in the story, you know, in the game that you're playing, then you get an advantage, you get an extra die towards it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a marrying between the Cortex Prime mechanics and Fate mechanics that tie into uh, the tie to Grok. Yeah. Um, Freeform Universal. Freeform Universal is another, I think, bastard child of a uh, of Fate Core and Cortex Prime, um, but I think. I think Freeform Universal does what bo they're both trying to do better. Um, and so I think the both things that I said about Cortex Prime and Fate apply to Freeform Universal, but a little bit more because I just think they, I just think he does it so much better. Yeah. Um, index card RPG. Uh, yep. So that one, there's a lot of similar things going on, but the way that in particular, the way that they handle um, adjudicating rules is brilliant. Uh, the way that uh, distance is, is metered off is great. So in a lot of the games that I play, and it's usually um, theater of mind, almost exclusively nowadays. And uh, and Index Card RPG does a fantastic job of facilitating that type of play. Uh, and part of that is... Is how they approach the rules, which I tried to emulate a bit. And the other part is how they handle distancing and being relative to where you're at and where you're trying to go, and how that distancing relates to the action economy. Uh, so Grok has something very similar going on as far as distance and action economy in you know a round or a sequence. Mm -hmm. um, Nave. Nave is. Obviously, uh, a huge influence on the OSR community, and was influenced on Grok too. And one of the things that I really loved about Nave was that you have these, you know, simplistic tables that allow you to roll up a character in just moments, and they're fleshed out full characters. You know, it's not just throwing words onto a character sheet and saying, "Oh, this is a character." Like they're like it. It it makes real good characters, and it fits perfectly with the system of Nave. Uh, and and that's one element that I try to go at with uh, with Grok. Um, there's so in in some of the recent uh, systems like Troika and Electric Bastion and things like that. There's a lot of uh, you know kind of pre-generated archetypes or that kind of thing, right? Um, which is awesome and it's very flavorful. And I think it's a great way to incorporate the flavor of a game into the characters right off the get go. Um, but 
that's not something that I leaned into as much in Grok. It was more so the Knave style of giving you all the bits and pieces and letting you put those bits and pieces together and doing it in a in a fast way. Mm-hmm. Um, Numenera. The biggest influence from Numenera um, is going to be from a man- mechanical side, the way that uh, effort kind of works out. Mm-hmm. Um, so I mentioned earlier about you know Fate and Cortex Prime kind of taking you out of your character and taking a perspective from the story. But that's not really the games that me or my group typically like to play. We like to be in the character and and let the story just come out of the action, you know, let and let that be secondary, not primary. Um, and playing Fate or Cortex Prime doesn't really cater that type of play. Um, and so Numenera's effort system gives the you know the players a type some ability to to push luck in their direction when it makes sense to, um, which is something that, that Grok takes influence from. Um, but it's kind of a bastard mechanic between Fate and, uh, and Numenera. But the I think the biggest influence from Numenera is, the, is part of the setting. Uh, if not, Grok is a bit more twisted and weird than Numenera. But, I mean, Numenera as a setting is, is fantastic. Mm-hmm. And their artwork... Like the art teams that they do in Numenera is so phenomenal. Have you had a chance to look through uh, Numenera work? Oh yeah, I've, um, I I I had been a fan of Numenera when it went before, um, cy- before Cipher System as we know yeah. as we know it was was a thing. It was just a spiritual successor to um, Planescape. Yep. Um. Yeah, so we played uh, one of the one of the other players in my core group DM'd. He got the you know the book, the Numenera books as soon as, as soon as they came out, mm-hmm. and so we played that right away. And uh, and the setting I thought was fantastic. You know, I loved the the rationale behind things, where it was kind of like a you know a hard science fantasy type setting. You know, there's rationale for why magic and science coexist together, and you know this long history about a series of. Uh, you know, falls of civilizations. I thought that was really an awesome setting for an adventure game. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the way that Grok's history is set up, uh, I tried to 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 have things make sense to why all this weird stuff would exist together. Um, because I think that for Gonzo, for weird for weird settings to work, you have to have uh, a backdrop. You know, you have to have some reality there, or else you know, if you have weird after weird, it's not weird anymore. It's just a new normal. No, then um, no, then you ha- then you have um, face with a frog, and everybody wonders if they're on drugs. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, I always tell people don't watch Face with a Frog unless you- unless you're high. <laughs> yeah, that's good advice. Um, but a- anyway, Savage Worlds. Uh, yeah, Savage Worlds. Um. Very so similar mechanic. It's funny going through this list that when you think about it and you can see how all these different systems and big big games really do pick pieces off each other. So Savage Worlds, you know, has uh, has die values attributed to you know put to their attributes, um, which is similar to how Grok does it. Um, they have exploding dice, which is a bit different, but. Uh, and they also do, you know, attribute dice values to their die values to their skills. Um, yeah, I find that the only, I find that <clears throat> the only way the only type of game designers who really work in a vacuum are the ones who work at Wizards of the Coast. <laughs> that's I don't think that's entirely fair because I think it's just they have so they have so much history and so much. Uh, that's expected for them to maintain. I think they, they just have I'm you know being, their hands tied up so much. Well, it <laughs> I you're not the only one to have, to have said that, and I've heard it in earnest. Well, but um, it a lot of a lot of it a, a lot of the reason I, a lot of the reason I say that is due is due is um due to that history. I've I've said many times over the years that I believe that game that um 
that that game has a nostalgia problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, I can see it. I... But um, beyond that, next one on the list is well, one that another one that I've reviewed here on the channel, Shadow of the Demon Lord. Yeah. Which is getting will... a kid friendly, which well, not kid friendly, yes. but a, a more family friendly take. Um, yeah, Shadow of so, the Weird Wizard. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, sometime this year, but um, unless I unless I see a hard unless I see a hard date, everything's up for grabs. Yeah, it doesn't matter. I'm backing it as soon as it's as soon as it's up. Uh, yeah. So uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord. There's so many awesome little things about that game, and that and you can tell when you read through it that from a mechanic standpoint that uh, everything has a purpose. Every every part has a purpose. Um, I was just actually rereading through some bits of it uh, this past week, and because I, I just picked up uh, Worlds Without Number, the hard copy, and so I was mm -hmm. I was reading through. I'm like, why? And I was just you know questioning things like, why does why is he retaining you know attribute values? Why is he retaining that when he's just deriving the bonus from it? Like, is it gonna have a? Is it gonna be a DC or not? And I was like, I think Shadow of the Demon Lords does it right. And I looked through, and you know, Shadow of the Demon Lords has a tribute score similar to D and D Pathfinder, and you get a bonus, but it also acts as a you know a DC, a defense score in some instances, right? And so, I mean, that's just an example of that like every mechanic in that game serves purpose, and they all work with each other. Yeah. And there's nothing in there by accident, mm -hmm. and uh, that type of synergy is something that I've always wanted to wanted to strive uh, that I've always strived for. Mm -hmm. um, and the uh, one part in particular that I really like about it is the action economy part of the game, um, yeah, where you have you know I've fast called, and slow actions. I've, yeah. always, I've always called that setup um, phase based. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was a that was a good one. That one, it's not. Ultimately, that's not how the uh, you know the action economy fell out for Grok, but it had a very it had a strong influence on it. Mm -hmm. um, and the I forget the name of the supplement he put out for it, but it's basically like a compilation of all the different hacks for Shadow the Demon Lord, and they're all good. Like they could have all made the book and replaced elements of it, and it would still be phenomenal. My mind keeps saying Victims of the Demon Lord, but no, that's not it. That's not it, but. Um, I know what you're talking about. The name just isn't um, coming to me at the moment. Yeah, yeah. But the fact that he had this, you know, this big, this big game that every piece works in tandem with the other, and that he still put in a, a you know, uh, an additional piece of work that has all the different hacks that could just be retrofitted, I thought was awesome. And so that was just something, you know, that I was trying to be mindful of holistically as I was putting Rock together. Um, and, uh, Surprised yeah, you, so surprised you when I the whole Boon and Bane thing that um, yep, yep. SDL does. Yep, that was uh that was another major one. Yep. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh and obviously, I mean, you know, with the Boon and Bane, you get the, you know, the D6s where you just add more D6s or less D6s. That was absolutely a big uh influence on Grok 2 and the way that advantages and disadvantages work out. Mm -hmm. Um I was actually toying with the idea of calling them boons or banes earlier on. And I still don't know if I made the rock call, but it's too late now. Oh, yeah. Um, Tech Noir, which I've, um, which I've, co I've covered it and its sister Mech Noir in the past here in mm -hmm. the, uh, here in the temple. Yeah. So that, that's an awesome game. Uh, it's light and it's effective and it's, I think it does a good job at keeping things narrative based, but character central at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and I loved its approach to you know aspects or tags in general. Uh, and so again, that was just something that I tried to uh, to emulate with Grok. You probably liked rolling all the damn dice. Who doesn't? Uh, who does? I love rolling dice, and I love rolling different shaped dice. I just don't like uh, it becoming tedious. Um. I hope to God you've never played Shadowrun. 
<laughs> I, I've, I've, uh, a buddy of mine's tried to convince me to play Shadowrun for a few years now, and he hasn't been successful yet. Shadowrun's got a got a fair amount of crunch, but I mainly I like, I like picking on the um the absurd amount of dice that can that can be generated sometimes. Although um, as controversial as it is, Sixth World is a little bit saner when it comes to the die distribution. Is that right? Okay. Uh, but apparently that much like with fourth edition D and D, that's one of those ca that's one of those scub cases of I'm supposed to I'm supposed to hate it, but I don't because they didn't because they didn't um clear the they didn't clear the checks. Right, right. <laughs> um uh, next one on my list is Troika. Um Yep. The biggest, I mean, there's some similar influences there, but the biggest one for me was was setting. Mm -hmm. Just me, the Troika does a fantastic job of just giving you minimal information in the book and just giving you this bizarre world. Uh, I I don't think I don't think Rock does as great of a job as Troika does at that. I don't I don't think any game can. Mm -hmm. um, but that's something that I strive for. Not unless you're on the drugs. Yeah, no kidding. I mean that they they did a fantastic job. I mean, just uh, you know, the Numinous Edition, doing you know having so many of those characters in the book, and they just it just oozes with flavor and setting. Mm. You don't have to read anything about the setting; it's just in the characters, and it's such a fantastic read. Yeah, and last on the list is Vagabonds of Dyfed. Yeah, so that one's uh, powered by the apocalypse hack for the most part but that one uses you know tags and things like that uh so there's very similar influence as far as you know fate and cortex and stuff like that but mm -hmm. another part that i really loved about vagabond's die fed is the digestibility and the layout of that book um i mean it's in my opinion i think it's right up there with electric bash and land as far as giving you what you need to know to play the game and making sure that they give it they design a game that's flexible enough to play it the way you want to play it now, with that with that kind of thing in mind, I when it come I um I had a few questions regarding what seems to be the three pillars of your of your design. First, the first one being the um universal um si the universal system and description based uh, modifiers. Okay. So with uni with universal action, it's if I understand this correctly, it's a it's a case of you're all you're always rolling you're always rolling um you're not rolling in phases it's this it's this one particular set of di set of dice and that's it. Uh, what do you mean by what do you mean by phases in this context? Um, like in in so, there there's no. You know how back you know how back in back in um, D and D and also in Pathfinder you had to roll to confirm crits or separating oh, um separating the two hit versus right. um, damage. Yep. Um, yeah. Or, so, so or even ga even games that have mixes of roll high and roll low. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. You're you're exactly right. And uh, um. And so part of the so part of the influence of that does come from Electric Bastion and, and into the odd too. But yeah, that's exactly right, and that's what it means. And that you know when you when you make an action roll, you're deciding if you both succeed and how well you succeed and what that means in the context of what's happening. Um, uh, and so I think it works. It works with Grok because because uh, of the way that aspects work. Uh, and how they're tied in with the core mechanic. Um, it's if there, so it went through many iterations to get here. Um, but that's only something I strive to do because, like I said earlier, I mean I love rolling lots of dice, but uh, I don't want. But I don't think it should slow down play to do it. Um, I hope you're smart enough to not pray to the dice gods. I do not pray to the dice gods. Um, a, uh, a good buddy of mine, uh, does pray to the dice gods excessively. He even, uh, rolls dice 
all of his dice 20 times before every game and then sacrifices the losers. Um, have you ever heard the adage, there there are no atheists in foxholes? Uh, yes, I have. I firmly believe that that can also apply to um, <laughs> gaming tables. <laughs> Because everybody, you know? everybody has their superstitions. The sacrifice thing—that's a new one. Um, the one that the one that got beaten into my head is do not touch other people's dice. Okay, I I haven't had a haven't had a group that was uh, particular about that. But uh, I mean, I've I've been there. I've been I've I've second guessed my. Uh... I'm not a, I'm not ordained, but there was the running gag at my table that I'm expected to bless everyone's dice because I was because. <laughs> Of the times where I was playing cleric. Oh yeah. So it just, um, and then la then later, I would I would house rule a cleric who was who was good at unarmed combat because because I didn't ha because we because I was running um I was running AD and D at the t at the time in my early days. Okay. Because well, I, and then yeah, and then when the monk class came in, I house ruled the hell out of that because the three point five monk was absolute trash. Agreed, and <laughs> and the Oriental Adventures version was solid. I like the Oriental Adventures versions. Um, are you talking about the AD and D Oriental Adventures one? No, I was talking about the three point three point five one. I haven't. 3. I actually 5, haven't read through the uh, AD and D version of that book. Three point five Oriental Adventures was Legend of the Five Rings in all but name. And yeah, if absolutely. I, <laughs> if I want Legend of the Five Rings, I'll play Legend of the Five Rings. That That's was, fair. That's um, fair. That was during that time where they were trying to do both roll and keep and D twenty in the same books, i.e., second edition L five R, and nobody likes talking about second edition L five R. That's a that's a very good take. You're absolutely right. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure some people bring it up. I'm sure I'm sure Wick will bring it up, but um, I'm but I'm just I'm just as sure that Wick does that Wick doesn't like people calling him out over his attitude on game balance. Which I We all have Yeah, I mean I don't I don't mean to pick I don't mean to pick on him, but it's it's kind of ironic that it, that he talked about game balance not being necessary for RPGs when his um void when his um void magic work on L, on L5R was raked over the coals for being absolutely uh, absolutely op yeah it's i can i can honestly see both sides and then that's really a, a recent epiphany for me uh because i mean i was talking to uh, a buddy of mine about um riffs <laughs> riffs the other day oh god R riffs <laughs> has been my whipping boy for 20 years you know and i was talking to like we were talking about game design or something. It was it was a conversation a while ago, and uh, you know, and I had you know the same you know the grapes that everyone has, and that it's just absurd the difference in power levels, and it doesn't make sense to have you know uh, God a glitter boy with you know some peon in the same party. It doesn't make any sense because they're just two wildly different things. And uh, and his argument was, yeah, sure, of course, but uh, you know. That's the responsibility of the people you're playing with to either balance their party or it's the responsibility of the DM to to make it work. And I mean, I can, okay. I can see where he's coming from, but I do think that's putting extra, that's putting extra expectations on the, on the yeah. GM. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to imagine there's a world where you can have your cake and eat it too. Oh, I've I've seen plenty I've seen plenty of games that man that manage a de that may manage a decent amount of balance. The pro the I'd say I'd I'd say the problem, especially exemplified in things like linear warriors and quadratic wizards, is as um as a good friend of the good friend of the temple Tanner had pointed out, um it's when it's when certain characters get are able to get more game out of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Um. As opposed as opposed to everybody having the, having this f having this field that they can that they that they can excel in that other people can't. Yeah, and I and again, I I can still see it from the other perspective. I think you're absolutely right, but I can see it from the other end, and that you know, if you have you know a a character who isn't a player who's not getting the same amount of game out of the game, uh, hopefully the GM recognizes that and. 
tailors what's happening in the world to facilitate them being more active in the game. I, but but that doesn't necessarily lend towards everyone's favorite type of play, right? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't really lend towards you know the approach of this is the obstacle, this is your world. You know what you do has consequences. It it's it's to be able to make that type of game work, it has to be you know a D and D style. This is the box that you're playing in type um, deal. Yeah, it's it's. I'm just I'm just not a I'm just not a fan of um you of using the GM as an as an escape button. Yeah, and and I especially don't when the rules are as dense and convoluted as Rifts is, anyways. Oh, well, yeah. Rifts has Rifts has a lot of problems, least of least of which being PCC balance. Right. Um. Uh, I'd say I'd I have the. The big reason that he, the big reason that Simbeta has been my whipping boy is the navigation of his books. Yeah, because I've, I've. It's made impossible. It, I've made it clear that I have an ironclad rule that if you, if you're, um, if you have a book that is over a hundred pages and you don't have an index, um, you just des- you deserve to have tomatoes thrown at you while your while your head's in the stocks. Agreed. Agreed. Extreme. I love the set. Go ahead, sorry. That may sound a bit that may sound a bit extreme, but um, when I I used I used I had taken some I had taken web usability for a bit, and I had gotten it beaten into my head that you that um when you present it you have to you have to let people know exactly where they are, where they need to go, and how to get there. And if you and if you do not do all three of those, your site has failed. Yeah, that makes sense. Because when someone's at the when someone's at the table when someone's GMing, if they need to look up a rule, they need it now. <laughs> right. Uh, and yeah, I mean. Oh, go ahead. So no, I, you're 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 absolutely right. And there are, there are too many gripes to be said about it. But the I think the one the one thing that I I really do like about riffs is the setting. I think that's the only truly redeemable part of riffs is the setting which is which is why i ended up laughing when a when a, when um riffs got a savage worlds version yes after yeah. after so many years of simbeta thro- simbeta throwing lawyers at anyone who tried to do a hack of his game and people yeah. ended up doing it anyways because you can't stop the internet <laughs> um but then again i'd expect nothing less from a guy who in the early two in the early 2000s was still was still using um, analog editing techniques mm-hmm. in 2004. I, I can see it. it makes sense. It makes total sense. I didn't know that though. That a cor- that's that's a court that's a, that's according to um that's a that's according to Bi- that's according to one of the guys behind um Palladium Fantasy. Okay. Um, because he ended up making this long. Expose on, on, on RPG.net in the early 2000s about his experience and the chain of events that got him fired. No kidding. Um. But, but um, between that, between that and the whole th- and the whole thing with Macross, I ended up laugh. I ended up laughing because, um, what I had been saying for years is that, um, Rifts needed a second edition. Just blow it all up and start fresh. Uh-huh. And the closest that there was was Ultimate Edition, which not only didn't fix the problem, it added new ones, yep. as well as adding as well as adding some stuff to try and drum up hype for the for an N-Gage game. <laughs> he thought he thought he, had, he thought he had it made by having a port of by having a N-Gage video game. <laughs> Just let that sink in. You know, I still i I do have the uh, new version of Savage Worlds, mm-hmm. but I haven't played it yet. Yes, um, wait. Yeah. At the very at the very least, I'll get I'll give credit I'll give credit to the fact that Pinnacle has put up um, conversion guides for yeah. their previous editions. It certainly makes my job a lot easier since it's not, since it's not a case of me flying blind. Um, right. And. I um I unfortunately am not Zadoichi, 
but when you talk about having a player facing fail forward mechanic is would it be fair of me to to discern from that that much like in much like in cipher the only people who are rolling die are the players yeah yep the only people that are rolling dice are the players mm -hmm. yep that's right um that and in uh similar to similar to savage worlds you're rolling against set target numbers mm -hmm. to determine varying degrees of success or failure um uh so there's uh, a bit of a caveat to that and that um the players and the characters may not necessarily know the so so the the director the person you know running the game and grok uh can influence the difficulty of actions by uh applying disadvantage to to roles mm -hmm. uh since the target numbers stay the same yeah. right and so modifying the difficulty is the same way difficulties modified just by you know any element in the world or on the character's traits that kind of thing uh so it's 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 essentially the same system mm -hmm. um but the director has control over how much information they give you know same as any other game right so yeah. uh so they could say you know if a situation comes up it's like well the floor is slippery and your torch just went out so you're in the dark and you're slipping and sliding, so you're gonna have a hard time. So that's maybe that's too disadvantage, mm -hmm. right? Um, but at the same time, the there could be elements in the world that the character doesn't necessarily know about, and maybe the director wants to keep that secret even from the player, just to I mean, suspense. Suspense is a great tool, right? And so they could say, uh, "You have those two things, but it's at a four. You know, you get four disadvantage, which is significant." Mm -hmm. uh, and so they they so doing something like that gives the players an understanding of at least an idea of what their odds are and how harrowing an action is mm -hmm. without necessarily breaking them out of their character to do that. And so that was the that was the tightrope I was attempting to balance with that. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing one thing that I'm one thing that I'm curious about because with uh, is with aspect. Not aspects, but um, assets. English, monk. Yeah. Um. Because because the way because the if I'm not mistaken, the way you have it set up is that it is that it's equal parts your equipment, and or at or rather um ciphers. To, right. Or its equipment. <laughs> right. Yep. And um and your health at the same time. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that gets into the, the slot-based resource system. So, so this was um, influenced somewhat from Into the Odd, somewhat from Nave, somewhat from some of the Into the Odd derivatives, like Mouse Ritter in particular did a really good job about this. And, mm -hmm. and like, uh, what was it, Hammer? Uh, I forget the inventory system. Hammer something inventory. Uh, anyway, so, so yeah, the, you have a a series of slots available to you as a, on your character sheet and those slots can be occupied by either you know assets you know your equipment or you know spells or things that you have you know your short-term memory type things or your mooks or your you know mercenaries that kind of thing you know things that help you out that you maintain and keep ready on your person uh as well as conditions which are pretty much you know, bad aspects that are tagged onto your character. Uh, so that's how damage is essentially tracked on that same resource track. Uh, and and so you have to balance those two things as well as kind of maintaining how much open slots you want to have to be able to have the flexibility to soak damage or take on new assets and things to make your character more effective at the things you want to make it more effective at. So, with that, with that, with that kind of thing in mind, I was going to ask about in, about an extra effort system, but you already have that in the form of well, effort. Right. But one thing that I'm curious about is, based on the way it's set up, would it be fair of me to say that you're aiming for a free for a free form setup? You're not really aiming for um, archetype design. It's it is kind of a mix of both. In that, so you the characters are aren't only defined by their 
by their assets and what's their what's on their resource slots, but they're also defined by their traits, which are which are pretty much permanent mm-hmm. assets, you know, parts of their character, you know, um, and that could be their personality or what their trouble is or you know their archetype or their background. Uh, you could rename them a few different ways, and so that's you know very similar to how fate does some things, and so so those are pretty much you know permanent assets that you can always tap into your character. So so you could approach it in two ways. You could uh you know you could have your background work as an archetype and say, well, yeah, I've I've been a blacksmith most of my life, so I know how to work on this armor, I know how to exploit it, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So so you can rationalize your archetypes, your backgrounds, your traits in a bunch of different ways. Um so so it's so it's it's both it's both worlds, I think. Now, when it comes to th- when it comes to things like um, assets, um, be- I'm I end up I end up being reminded of one of of a minor issue that I have with with certain games that ha- that have these sort of these sort of descriptors, and it's mm-hmm. it's a trap that I see a lot of games fa- a lot of games fall into, and that is not providing guidance on what it on what might be a bridge too far regarding. Say regarding say an asset, um, yeah, this is a um, fate is a, is especially a bit especially a big um, culprit of this because even though it, even though it has um, aspects like high concept and tr- and trouble and then some freebies, um, yep. it's not very good at giving guidance as to what would be good ideas or bad ideas for aspects. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, is that is that something that you've considered when it comes to when it comes to advising um, people who want to go, want to go off the go off the beaten path with assets, for yeah. So it is, and that's something I was mindful of, both on you know character traits, so the permanent things about people's care about your character, mm-hmm. and the temporary things like assets. Uh, and so, I think part of it is that a Gonzo setting like Grok caters towards being overly mundane and overly extravagant. And so I, so I think the setting helps do some of that heavy lifting, but uh, but through playtesting, what we ended up find, what I ended up finding was that uh, since the since the resource slots is a shared pool between your assets that you keep with you and your conditions and things that happen bad to you, mm-hmm. pretty much, um, there's pretty much in every party there's a push to have assets as important as possible. You know, so if there's something mundane, they'll players tend to disregard it, and so there's this constant push for the the weirder and more powerful and potentially more dangerous, um, which again I think just ties into uh, the setting a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as the as far as guidance on on traits and assets and things like that, so in character creation, I think I actually put some of the tables in the kickstarter yeah you yeah you did yeah yeah and so even those are are really all over the place right and uh and again i think part of that is the gonzo science fantasy setting uh part of it um and another part is trying to give the director and the party you know the players enough control to play the game that they want to play you know whether they want to play commoners or weird aliens or multi-dimensional beings or specters or you know combination thereof mm-hmm. uh giving them the ability to do it and i think it and i think you're absolutely right in that it's a double-edged sword right with the more flexibility you have the more potential you have to uh to shoot yourself in the foot yeah it's for that reason that i th- that i i think i think that prov- i think that providing um providing get gu- providing guidance in one form or another is something that's vital and an example that I always that I always bring up when I whenever I've covered this kind of thing is a two is a two page section in Thirteenth Age, which is right now right now is one of my all time, one of my all time favorite takes on anything D twenty or D related. Um, it has it has a aspect like concept called the one unique thing, and. It's exactly what it says on the tin. It's one is one unique thing to your to your given character. But 
within the character creation chapter, there's there's a little section just going going through a list of um, good idea good ideas for one for one unique things, um, questionable ones, and absolutely not. And go and goes into what and goes into why regarding each one, regarding each one of those. I'm, I'm massively paraphrasing, but that's ki that's kind of what I mean when I talk about guidance about where the line is. Right. So if so, so if somebody has something that might that that they have as an aspect that might be a little bit too powerful for the section that it's in. That yeah. Or the or that would or that wouldn't fit the because you you mentioned mundane you mentioned mundane extravagance as a th as a thing with the set with the setting. So that's some trying to maintain that is something else to consider as well. Right. Yeah, and I think it's. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, and I think we we can, we were kind of touching on this a little bit earlier, and that I think it really depends on what type of game, you know, you're trying to play as a party, and I think especially with with this type of game like rock and some others that it pulls influence in that there has to be some some judgment calls from the players from the group and the and the director mm -hmm. as far as what as far as what makes sense for the type of game they're playing yeah um and it's and it can be and it can be highly situational like anything else right i mean say i mean i think you can fall into the same pit traps in in any game, I mean, if you take D and D, the staple of the industry, as an example, if you have a, um, a highly charismatic character who can talk the pants off of anything, but they never get in a situation where they get to talk to anybody because they're in a dungeon crawl. I mean, that's just the that's just the game that they're playing. You know what I mean? And so I think you just have to you have to manage the expectations of the group you're playing with appropriately, and likely have a good session zero so everyone knows what's on the table. Yeah, even before I knew what session zero was, I would always write out these um, primers. Yeah, and, yeah, me too. Um, if some, if if some, if somebody, if um, and in those, in those primers was you was usually, um, what get what rules we were running because I would I would do a lot of one shots at my LGS, um. What kind of tone? What kind of tone I'm going for, and what would what are good ideas and what are bad ideas? Um, for example, um, I was running a I was running a one shot of Lex Arcana um, once, about um, about a about a year or so ago. Okay. And I had made explicitly clear in the primer, this is an investigation leaning campaign. If you play if you play murder hobos, you're prob you're probably gonna get <laughs> killed. Yeah, and someone didn't listen. They ended up getting killed. Yelled, yelled at me, and that, and that, and then I said, um, "By that, by that logic, if you, by that logic, if you're, if you get, if you get into a car crash, it is, my, it is, um, my fault for telling you, for telling you to buckle your seatbelt." <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, it, yeah. Yeah, I, and it's funny. I used to do the same thing, and I didn't even think about that being a a stand-in for for a section zero. But I did the same thing as far as you know, giving the giving players like you know a primer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's it's the same thing. I think it, a lot of it's just making sure that the expectations are in alignment with the group. Yeah, the the big reason I do that is because I would see some I would see some DMs just say, just say that. We're ru that we're running a fantasy campaign, and I'm like, that doesn't tell me anything. Nope. Yep. <laughs> it only yeah, tells me right. just enough to piss me off. <laughs> but, but, um, one thing I'm a bit curious about, because because I don't think that was extrapolated on, is how you're going to handle advancement. Um, yeah. So. Uh, did it? Nope, I didn't have the uh, the advancement section in there. So, advancement advancement in Grok is uh, milestone type advancement. That's what I was suspecting. Yep. So it's it's very dependent on the context of what's happening in the game, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so there is some there are some mechanics in there as far as trading in. You know, when milestones happen and it makes sense for traits to change, traits can change or 
conditions can change, your assets can change, right? So it's kind of an organic type thing when those milestones happen in the game. Uh, but there's also some mechanics in there to where you can uh, pretty much uh, increase the amount of resource slots that you have on your character mm -hmm. um, over time. And you can also trade in a few resource slots to increase a, a, uh, an attribute die. Mm -hmm. So there's so, so so it's not just you know descriptor based advancement. There's actually some uh, mechanical meats and potatoes yep. type advancement built in there too. Now, whenever it comes to the, whenever it comes to this sort of free form equipment, there's always one there's always one item I use as kind of a benchmark to whether or not this would be um, put whether or not this would be pushing the limit. Okay. Um, did you ever watch Men in Black? Yeah. Do you remember the noisy cricket? Yeah. <laughs> I um I have you I have used the noisy cricket on and off as a ma either a magic item or a tech based item in one form or another because I love giving my players very awesome. overpowered but overpowered but dangerous weaponry. Yes. Yes. And the idea of it, the idea of a massive of a tight of a tiny little gun have creating massive sonic blast but you end up getting you end up getting knocked yeah. ass end over tea kettle when you try and fire the thing is yeah, right is um right up my alley and i'm curious if something like that would end, would be um a bit overkill in as a asset in your system no i that's that's a fantastic item and i'm actually thinking about i just wrote it down because i might have to uh to put a version into one of these sheets because because it's it's a great item because it has it has a benefit and a detriment built into it and it makes total sense uh but no it would fit i think that i think a noisy cricket would fit in great uh it all depends on you know like we were saying earlier you know the expectations of the game mm -hmm. but in my vision of the game and how i've ran it it would fit perfect yeah uh we actually had <laughs> in one of the play tests uh uh one of the players played as a as his first Sona, and one of his items was a universal op can opener, which is pretty much like a can opener shaped plasma torch. Mm -hmm. And it was awesome because I mean it was it was it was weird enough and specific enough to where it had some restrictions built into it. Right, you can only open things that you could open with a can or metal based things, and it can only open things so big. But it's a plasma torch, right? So you have some benefits and some restrictions built into it. Yeah. Uh, I think one other. I think one other was a was a gravity belt, which you would th you would think would con would <laughs> control would um control gravity so somebody could fly. Well, kind of. What it would basically do is change what direction down is. I, I'm pretty sure. I have anti gravity boots on one of the on one of these lists somewhere. Yes, I agree with you. That's a fantastic item. You want somebody because somebody asked me if there was a way that they could that they could weaponize falling damage. Yeah, I can see it. Um, I I do remember I do remember at one point have having an ass having making a uh, asset. I think this was for one of the rare times I played um, the Dresden Files. Because I have a love hate relationship with fate, um, because so somebody had a colleague of mine had said that you could, that that um you need you need to have death in order to make in order to have players be interesting. So the approach I did was ha was have a care have a um asset that is curse of the cockroach. Every time every time he ends up being dead, um after after about five minutes he just pops right back up. <laughs> <laughs> that's good and the dm got very the dm and the players got very creative when it came to trying to figure out if there was anything that could actually keep him dead yeah so it, well, it was a good way to introduce some some dark humor into into the game yeah i mean the problem is waking up from being dead in a place you absolutely don't want to be that's the problem well it was you Usually, what would it, usually what would happen is he would be a literal meat shield. <laughs> um, occasional, occasionally, um, I think in, I think in one instance he got sw he got swallowed up by a worm and then, um, Oof. 
then then before before he got disintegrated he uh, he um turned up he pulled the pin on a on a grenade that he had that he that he had on nice. his person that's awesome so he ended up dying he ended up dying twice but he went but he managed to give the thing the worst case of indigestion. <laughs> um, and of course, I've all, my favorite that I've always told people is a rune trap that I created way back in the day because it's kind of surprising how many how many of my trap ideas I stole from Looney Tunes. Um, the up button. Well, how how does it work? It will. I described it as a rune trap at the time. The and I've I've told the story of, I've told the story a handful of times, but the it, the simple way to the simple way is that you step you step on the thing you go up. If you want the more complicated version, it's as if you you are flying at forty miles an hour for six seconds straight up. But doesn't matter if anything's in the way. You ha it's it it says you're going in that direction for six seconds at yeah. that speed. And if something solid happens to be in the way, like say a wall made of adamantite, well, you yeah. see what a compactor does to a car. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, and is it is was the up button mobile? Were you able to move it around? Um, you had to you had to lay it. If you if you wanted to, if you wanted to relay it, you'd have to pick the thing up very carefully so you don't set it off. Right. By very carefully, I mean it's like a, it's like trying to it's like trying to disassemble a bomb. Right. Yeah, that's an awesome that's an awesome item. <laughs> yeah. Is, um, I think I I think at one at one point I wanted to do something dumb with a wizard, so I gave him a I gave him a scroll that that was um, summon anvil. <laughs> the, an the anvil would Back not me. appear out of the anvil would not appear out of nowhere if you if you catch my drift. Well, right. it, would, it would just <laughs> not right in front of the wizard. <laughs> yeah, a butt of holding, if you will. Yeah, I wa I wanted to I wanted to do the good I wanted to do the good old anvil drop that I saw in so I saw in so many cartoons as a kid. Yeah. So, yeah, that's awesome. So. There, so there's there were plenty of there were plenty of times where he'd, br where he'd break out the thing and then tell somebody, um, don't look up. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. You know, and then the, um, of course, then I'd up then I up the thing to do a piano drop because why not? Yeah, <laughs> because excellent. everybody loves the piano drop. Yeah. So I've wanted I I haven't had the chance to, but I've wanted to play a game of uh, tune for a while now. I've played I've played it. It's it's all right. It's very dependent on, uh, on um, on the table being in on the joke. Yeah, yeah, I can like, see that. Like if you've get if you've if you've got if you've got a table and nobody at the table knows who Chuck Jones is, um, it's not going to be as as successful. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think that's I think that's comedic oriented games in general. You have to you have to really commit to it for it to work. Um, truth be told, I have an e I have an easier time getting people into paranoia than I do in t than I do to tune. I can see that. I can see it. I mean, that's that's an awesome game. Hmm. I, 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 I want to play more paranoia. Yeah. Um, I was I was super happy to see it get a computer game. I haven't played Happiness is Mandatory yet. I didn't know it came out as a computer game. Yeah. I'll have um, to look at that. So unlike, unlike some, I do I do not thumb I do not thumb my nose at compu at computer role playing <laughs> games the way some old, the way some old school types do. I commend you for it. Well, that and because I know I know my history and um, D and D and computer games have have a closer oh, yeah. relationship than people will than pe than some people are willing to admit. Abs absolutely. Yep. Uh, all those old school uh, text based RPGs, man. Well. It goes all it goes all the way back to the old Plato servers in the seventies. Is that right? Yeah, a lot of people a lot that's one thing a lot of people kinda skim on, which is understandable because the um reach of the, the reach of those old servers was very, 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 very limited. Right. But there was but somebody did put a program called D and D, um, with lowercase letters of course. And 
of and of course that of course stuff like that would lead to would eventually lead to stuff like Zork and then that would lead to yeah. Dungeon, which would lead to yeah. um multi user dungeon. Dungeon being an unlicensed yeah. port of Zork. And yeah. that's how you ended up getting MUDs, which everything exploded out from that. <clears throat> yeah, you had me at Zork. Mm -hmm. um, but now, as I as I understand it, since this this is a zine style, so do you do you plan do you plan on having um, points of interest when it comes to when it comes to the world of Grok within the book? So it's uh, currently it's a it's a big picture as far as setting and how the world got there. Uh, and setting up the setting the stage for the different kind of factions within the world, uh, and then the specifics are left to are left to the players. Um, but one, but I'm thinking of putting in a uh, a few different actual scenarios. But I don't know if that's going to be an add-on or a uh, stretch goal, or if it's going to be a separate uh, separate item altogether yet. A hex crawl might make an interest might make for an interesting stretch goal. Yeah. Um, yeah, that I, could work. Yeah, I might be a little biased because I because I like hex crawls. Right there with you. Hmm. But with but with the but um now with that in mind. What are you shooting for as far as a release window? Not a hard date, but a general window. Are you aiming for, like, um, winter 2020? I was going to say winter 2022, but we're in winter. <laughs> yeah, uh, so it's the, the, the writing is really complete. I mean, I just uh, got some new art for it. Uh, once the Kickstarter became more successful than I thought, I figured I'd mm -hmm. uh, decide to not <laughs> I decided to spend any money I was gonna get in getting more art. So I'm getting more art and uh doing a second pass on layout to make sure it's as good as it can get. Uh but but that's it. All the content is done, play test and ready to go. So um editing too. So looking at digital release um the month after the Kickstarter, so probably late April. And then physical release in the May, so long as there are no uh, supply chain shortages on paper, mm -hmm. uh, getting it to me. And w and of, co of course, just to make sure I don't jinx it. Thank you. Appreciate it. I wasn't kidding when I said there are no atheists at the gaming table. <laughs> you brought it back, yeah, totally right. Yeah, I mean that's that's the plan. Oops, mm -hmm. that's the plan. So. Hopefully, uh, I know it's it's pretty aggressive, but like I said, pretty much everything is is ready to go. So, mm -hmm. well, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. And I appreciate God. Anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Thanks, Walter. I really appreciate you having me on and giving me a chance to talk about my game. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>